as technology marches forward, it's inevitable that something gets left behind, right? I mean, some of this technology is a part of our culture. It's a part of our experience. Maybe. I mean, emulation could help us relive the past or help us preserve the past. Uh, that's a thing. Playing Ocarina of Time on this is a super lot of fun. That's a Nintendo game from way back in the day. Let's dive in. So first up, let's talk about emulators. What's an emulator? Well, an, an emulator emulates something else. This is a Raspberry Pi running inside the Pi Zero DMG. It can emulate a lot of things. It's not the original Nintendo hardware or the Sega hardware or the Game Boy Advance hardware or DOS machine hardware. I can play DOS games, adventure, Lu LucasArts games. This is not the platform those games were designed for, but it's fast enough that it can pretend to be, it can provide a reasonable approximation. Just like, you know, there's something to be said for listening to a record on an original record player versus a recording. It's kind of like that. Game console preservation is kind of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about preservation. And emulators differ from the actual real hardware. So the thing that synthesizes music in an original Nintendo Entertainment System. We can approximate that, that in software, but you know, like the old tube radio people and the old audio people, they say, well, it does not, doesn't quite doesn't quite sound the same. There's also a thing you can do where you can translate from like one graphics layer to another. Things like Vulcan can translate graphics calls from you know one genre of hardware to another. You don't really see that as much with game consoles, but a little bit. Game consoles, typically the emulators actually do work from dumps of the original ROM in the case of cartridge-based systems, or dumps from the physical disc for like CD or DVD-based systems. But the actual console part of it, there may or may not be some intellectual property bits from a console in there. Sometimes it's a complete re-implementation. Depends on how good it is and how good the implementation is and how much reverse engineering has been done. But emulation does have a catch. And uh, let's, well, let's talk about the history of uh, game emulation for a second. The first thing that we could find as evidence of like what we would consider mainstream game emulation was a uh, Famicom emulation, also known as the Nintendo Entertainment System in the US. It's an emulator, uh, the FM Towns, a Japanese PC uh, from the late 80s, early 90s. So you could run it on there. Here in the US, emulation became much more common in the 90s, thanks to programs like Nesticle, which was sort of free on the internet. That's an NES emulator which ran under MS-DOS and later Windows 95. Uh, Yuji Naka, hopefully I'm saying his name right, one of the uh, creators of Sonic the Hedgehog, programmed a Famicom emulator for the Sega as well. So, ooh, it's a competing platform. Sega Genesis Mega Drive uh, type thing, but he did that as a hobby. So, yeah, we couldn't, couldn't clear the legal hurdles for that. Not unlike clearing Mario for the IBM PC, which the, the people that later founded id Software did. Flash forward to 1999, a Nintendo 64 emulator called Ultra HLE was released. Ultra HLE was the first emulator for a video game console that was uh, being sold at the time. That angered Nintendo. Uh, they prepared a legal action and adopted a really, really aggressive stance against emulation of the platform on which you can run their games. But. Uh, kind of sucks. You can play with Ultra HLE on archive.org. It doesn't contain any of uh, Nintendo's intellectual properly, uh, property, but uh, it doesn't really run the games properly. So it's like, I can kind of load Ocarina of Time, but the music's kind of messed up and it just wasn't really the same experience as it was on the console. Like for real, I'm not just imagining that. Uh, There's also Bleem. So in the case of Bleem, it was a PlayStation emulator and that was sold commercially, but uh, that unleashed Sony's lawyers. And you never want to be on the wrong side of Sony's lawyers, let me tell you. Now, Sony ultimately lost that case, but Sony was able to spend so much money fighting the relatively small and tiny uh, developers of Bleem that they were basically bankrupted. I'm hoping that the internet and communities like ours uh, can provide some better immunity for that kind of thing today than was available in 1999. Um, it really is unfortunate what happened to Bleem, but they did set a legal precedent that there is some kind of a, a, an allowance here for emulating these old systems or building something to be able to run your old software that's not the old thing. 
Uh, but it did also lead to a chilling effect because a lot of commercial companies don't want to touch it. Why do you want to create a legal emulator when the company that you know owns the thing that you're emulating could sue you into oblivion, regardless of how right or wrong that is, uh, and now it's uh, seen as kind of a source of revenue. Uh, Nintendo, for example, they have the Virtual Console, which emulates several Nintendo systems, and that has become their own revenue source. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, first come, first serve, but it's super locked down. You can't really do a lot with it outside Nintendo's ecosystem. Sega Genesis games, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Sony releasing ISOs of PS1 games on the PS3. Uh, Nintendo is uh, doing the online subscription thing now, instead of the virtual console, and they have been for years. And it's like, oh, we're gonna put this game in the vault that you're not gonna be able to buy it anymore. But it's an online game, it's pretty silly. Um, overall, what I'm trying to say is that emulation now today is incredibly mature, and even something as pedestrian as a Raspberry Pi is many orders of magnitude faster than it needs to be to provide a really high fidelity emulation experience. It's still not perfect. There's still bugs, there's still timing issues, but it's kind of a thing. Uh, publishers have also used emulation and translation layers uh, for backward compatibility, but it's a little hard to get that right because the CPU architecture changes and sometimes um, you have to wait a couple of generations before getting the emulation just right. So it can be a little problematic. It can be a little problematic in terms of intellectual property too because Sometimes, especially with those newer Sony consoles, you have to dump the BIOS or you have to dump something that exists in a console in order to be able to use it. And you can't distribute that if you write emulation software. Um, sometimes the hardware has bugs that also have to be reproduced in the software that eliminates them. Uh, there's maybe some of those bugs around the whole Donkey Kong thing. You know, Billy Mitchell was allegedly caught, you know, illegally using an emulator to record his eye score to you know, one of the graphical glitches that was in the recording, it's like suggests that maybe an emulator was being used, maybe not, I don't know, but uh, it can get a little weird when the emulator is not actually exactly perfect. But the important thing here is not to be able to play uh, old copies of Ocarina of Time, it's preservation, because it's not just the game, it's you know something that time would forget about especially due to low sales or lack of interest. Remember the Atari game, the uh, ET phone home game, which was just awful? There's a, land a landfill of those cartridges out there somewhere. And it's like, well, we should preserve this, even though it was a terrible, terrible train wreck. Sometimes, you know, there can be demand for a game. You know, Nintendo didn't sell that many copies compared to how many video games sell today because video games weren't super popular Compared to, compared to how they are today, when we're talking about like the Nintendo Entertainment System, and so like an original boxed copy of Mario, Super Mario Brothers, can go for over a million dollars. Well, you can still enjoy that. You can enjoy some of those old DOS games and some of that on the Internet Archive, but the console companies have been uh, less tolerant of, of that kind of thing. And it's also kind of prohibitive to pay, play these games on the original hardware. Like, it's less of an issue on things like Nintendo and Super Nintendo, but like middle-aged consoles, like the original Xbox where they start to add online function functionality and like the Xbox 360, keeping that hardware running, but also having the online functionality, it's basically not there. If you get a PS Vita, uh, I think I'm saying that right, you know, the online store Sony's basically made it impossible to buy anything or do anything with it. It's like, but the hardware is still perfectly usable. It's got an OLED screen, it's really nice. You basically gotta hack it in order to be able to, to make it usable. And that should be legal. That should be something that's not just preservation, that's also keeping devices out of landfills. I mean, all that sounds great, but the catches here are those, you know, ethical and legal issues around emulation. Now, I think I've got the right to play Ocarina of Time because I own Ocarina of Time and I own the console that it was meant for, but I don't like to enjoy it in that format anymore. I want to enjoy it in this format. If they're gonna say, hey, you're licensing this game, you're not buying it, all right, I have the license to enjoy it. And that's a license I'm going to exercise. That's kind of a judgment call, I guess. You know, either way, some, some countries, some jurisdictions, perhaps are a little bit more restrictive than others. But I think this is something that we're going to have to uh, face. And companies are not going to be willing to give up that revenue stream. You know, eventually books go out of copyright. Eventually video games should also go out of copyright and be public domain. But, but the time Super Mario Brothers goes out of you know, copyright and is in the public domain, the hardware to play it will be near non-existent. And it doesn't have to depend on the hardware. We can use emulation. And the technology for emulation will have gotten even better because um, you can do uh, uh, field, programmable, field programmable gate arrays. So we're literally recreating the actual physical circuits 
uh, and some of the more popular emulators now for older consoles use relatively expensive FPGAs to literally recreate the circuit. Now copyrights are really interesting. Because of the copyright extensions, it is possible to actually reclaim copyright. I wonder if the authors of Super Mario Brothers can reclaim their copyright from Nintendo. That is an option under US law. I don't know if they'll actually do that, but that, that would be maybe interesting. I mean, are those programmers gonna see a cent from ongoing sales of, of uh, Super Mario Brothers the way that a, a book author will continue to receive royalties from now until the end of time? I don't think so. There's, I, don't, I don't see any evidence for that kind of thing when I was doing some work. Uh, you know, talking about modern stuff like Switch emulation, the new Metroid game. Nintendo already went out after a bunch of streamers that were streaming it because they were running it in emulation. And Nintendo was not really super happy about that. Look, if I bought a license to the game, you know, what, what difference does it make if I enjoy it? Well, if you think that, you know, Nintendo's within its rights there, it's like, what if I buy a book? And it's like, can I read that book underwater? Can I read that book, you know, sleep laying in bed? Can I read it laying in a chair? What right does the book publisher have to say about how I enjoy that? I've paid for the right to use that intellectual property. What do they care how I use it? You know, if you're pirating something, piracy is illegal either way. Does that affect future game sales and that kind of thing? Well, if Nintendo's business model depends on everybody buying a game two or three times, I would say that that's not a viable business model to begin with. Just because I enjoy the stories that Nintendo and Sony and Square Enix and other companies like that have to tell, doesn't mean that they have an automatic right to go picking through my pocketbook, you know, anytime. So suppose I've got Star Trek on VHS, I definitely do have that. And the DVD became the norm. Now I transferred it from VHS to DVD, I should have the right to do that to my media server. And actually I am allowed to do that with VHS. DVD, it gets a little fuzzier because I have to circumvent a copy protection device in order to do that. I think that's okay for personal use, but I don't think that the law says that. I don't really want to find out exactly what the law says about that. A lot of ultra wealthy people are, are really wish they could have a home jukebox that they could just load all their DVDs in and then stream it to any TV in the house, but legally, I don't think so. I don't think that there's any company out there that's building said DVD jukebox where you're transferring the medium. Um, I mean, I'm licensed to receive this content and the, v the Home Taping Act says that I can tape it, but you know, rights companies have been furiously trying to close that loophole. It was the Supreme Court ruling in the United States, it's three to two, almost made the VCR illegal. And now they're trying to make the digital version of a VCR illegal just because it's got some copy protection stuff in it. Whereas in a VCR, it's an analog copy protection. So I don't know. But fortunately, there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of really great work around video game preservation. I've linked below some of the, some of the ones that caught my eye. You should definitely check that out or check out the post for this in the level one forums. I think that preservation, there's a cultural component here. It is really important. It's not just, you know, it's not just my selfish desire to be able to play a video game on my handheld, you know, Game Boy looking, inspired by, but for the purposes of copyright, wholly distinct from uh, the original, you know, Game Boy design, a uh, handheld video game console that lets me play a whole bunch of different things. I'm, I own what's on here, or at least I own the cartridges for, for what's on here. I format shifted it from proprietary cartridge to digital storage, uh, that should not be a gray area. It's like, surprise, we're gonna send the Gestapo after you to arrest you because we're Nintendo and we can afford to spend millions of dollars to harass you or Sony, we can you know sue the developers into oblivion and it doesn't matter that, that they ultimately won their court case. Uh, Sony's not gonna pay their lawyer fees. This is not an ethical behavior for large companies. They really should be punished somehow uh, the only option that we have is to vote with our wallets, but there's so many people and so few are unaware of those kinds of issues that uh, moving forward, I don't think we can make our voices heard, but the least we can do is try to protect the preservationists. So if any of these companies are bullying a preservationist, um, we'll probably have to step up as a community and deal with it. And what of this level one? I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.